Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic. Positronic. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to talk to you about the latest episode of The Last of Us. It was called Endure and Survive. And it was a special Friday night episode because on Sunday there's some kind of thing on TV and I guess they didn't want to compete with it. Um, I think it's a sporting contest of some import. I, I don't really know. Anyway, as this episode opened, we find ourselves seemingly in a flashback of when the group that Joel and Ellie are currently running from, the Resistance, originally took down the QZ and Fedra in the area. And at this point in time, Henry and uh, the little brother Sam are on the run, and apparently Sam is deaf, which wasn't the case in the game. The leader lady, Kathleen, the Resistance leader, is looking for Henry, just as she still is in the present, which was last week's episode. And she threatens to kill a room full of people if they don't tell her where Henry is. So they tell her that he's with someone called Edelstein. And even though she gets her information, she has them all killed. It was at this point that we see Henry and Sam take refuge in the attic that Kathleen found their stuff in last week after she had killed the doctor, who it turns out is Edelstein who was helping them get set up there. What we don't know is why Henry is on the run with his brother at this point, or why the doctor is helping them. As he's helping them get set up in this attic, the doctor realizes that Sam is scared, and he tells Henry. So Henry gives him a whole bunch of crayons that he must have rounded up from different places, and tells him that they're safe there. But because the place is kind of ugly, they need to decorate it. So this, of course, he's, you know, he's doing to distract Sam from being scared. And they both begin drawing on the walls. And, and of course, he tells him in, in sign language. Then we fast forward to 10 days later, which is the day that Ellie and Joel showed up. Sam keeps saying that he's hungry and he's wondering when the doctor's coming back. But of course, they don't know the doctor isn't coming back. A little later, though, they seem to realize, or at least Henry does, that the doctor's not coming back, that he's probably dead, and that they have to get out of the attic at the building and go find food because sam has been drawing pictures of himself as a superhero henry gets the idea to paint his face so that he looks like the superhero he's been drawing which explains why he had paint on his face when he and henry found joel and ellie last week it's at this point that they hear the ruckus of what happened when joel and ellie arrived in fact we see henry looking out a window just before he and sam were going to exit the building and witness what happened when Joel crashed the truck into the other building last week. So they don't go out the door. They were going to go out because it's right across from all the ruckus, but they come up with a different plan. And at nightfall, we see them in the building where they found Joel and Ellie, and they encounter the glass that Joel had left on the floor. And so they both approach slowly with guns. Next, the episode picks up where we left off last week with Henry and Sam drawing down on Joel and Ellie. But they explain that they don't want to hurt them, and they decide to trust them if they don't pull any crazy moves. So they all sit around a lantern and have some snacks that Ellie and Joel share with them, which they got from Bill. Joel basically says, you know, when the snacks are done, okay, that was nice, but let's part company now. And Henry says, well, I'm guessing you guys came up here so you could scope out the city from a high vantage point to figure out a way out. But once the sun comes up, I can just show you a way out. So the next morning, it turns out that Henry's angle is that he isn't a violent person or a tough person and that he's never really had to face down anybody in real life. And he needs Joel, who he realizes has done this, <laughs> to help him clear the way out so that they can all get out because he's not able to do it, especially since the gun he was using is not loaded. And it turns out that the reason he's wanted is because he was a collaborator against the resistance on the side of Fedra. So the plan, anyway, is to enter the tunnels underneath the city and use them to get out without being detected by the resistance. But the issue is that the reason there aren't any infected in town is because they were driven underground by Kathleen and her people 15 years previously. So when Joel says, yeah, that's crazy, we can't go through those tunnels if that's where all the infected are, Henry assures him that the tunnels are essentially empty, which he says he knows because someone he was working with from Fedra said they were all but empty three years previously, which, of course, we know isn't true. As they walk through the tunnels, they seem to find some kind of underground daycare or school that must have been set up during the early days of the infection when people were living in the tunnels. Ellie and Sam really seem to be connecting, 
even more so when they find a comic book in this school or whatever, and they're able to communicate with each other about it because they're both fans of it. And then they kick around a ball that they find. Joel and Henry talk, and it turns out that Henry did in fact kill someone, though indirectly, when he gave up Kathleen's brother to Fedra because they had a drug that he needed for Sam, who has or who had leukemia, which of course explains why Kathleen wants to kill him because after he gave up her brother, Fedra killed the brother. Speaking of Kathleen, she has a talk with her man, Perry, and she explains that when her brother was in jail right before he was killed by Fedra, he told her to forgive Henry and not to do anything to him, but she doesn't understand what the point of that would be, so obviously she didn't take his advice or honor his request. Next, Joel, Ellie, Henry, and Sam come out of the tunnels into a neighborhood and are approaching a river that they plan to cross, but as they're walking through the neighborhood that seemed abandoned, they're fired upon from a house at the end of the street. So Joel decides to make his way to the house so that he can enter it from the back and confront the shooter and take him out or whatever. And I just want to say at this point that the people involved in the set, de set decoration and the art direction on this show are crazy talented, the FX people as well, because everything looks real, like a real post-apocalyptic setting. And we know from some behind the scenes footage that ran after the episode that this neighborhood set was in fact a set indoors. And you cannot tell, uh, it, you know, houses and streetlights and cars and trees. And it's just, it looks real. Anyway, Joel gets into the house. He goes up to the floor where the shots were coming from. And he finds a guy sitting there shooting from the window. And when the guy doesn't hand over his gun, the way Joel asked him to, Joel kills him. And it turns out that he was using a radio and was in communication with, with Kathleen, to whom he ratted them out, because it would seem that she figured at some point Henry and Sam would try to make their way out of town that way, because I guess it's one of the only ways, and placed him there to watch in case they showed up, which is crazy shrewd. Anyway, he overhears on the radio that they're coming, because I guess the guy had told them they were there. So Joel yells out the window, telling the kids to run before he picks up the guy's sniper rifle and starts shooting at this giant truck that's coming towards them with a big plow on the front of it that says run on it. It's barreling down the street with this plow in the front, clearing out all the stuff in the way, cars, garbage barrels, just ramming through everything. After a couple of shots, the gun jams, but Joel manages to get it working again. And he shoots the driver of the truck, causing it to crash and massively explode when the gas leaks. But of course, Kathleen came with more people and more vehicles and they arrive and all of her people get out, guns drawn. And she calls out to Henry from a distance, asking him to come out. And he says that he will if she lets the kids go. But she says she's not going to because Ellie's with Joel, who killed one of her other men. And Sam's fate is tied to his which means she's sick in the head. But he comes out anyway after telling Ellie to take Sam and run at the right moment. Just as she's about to kill him, right there in the street, just gun him down in the street, the truck starts to go into a sinkhole in the ground where the explosion happened. Just as Joel is ready to start shooting again at the resistance people, everybody turns and looks at the hole because they can hear you know, a bunch of noise and because it just swallowed a truck. And in that moment, we see a whole bunch of infected climb out of the hole and start running towards all the resistance people in the street like a massive flood. And all of the resistance people who had guns start firing them like crazy, but they're not hitting all of the infected because there's just so many. And Joel has to start shooting them from the window to, to protect Ellie. And one almost gets her, in fact, and takes her down, but Joel shoots it. And then Perry instructs the people who are still sitting in the cars that they came in to run the infected down, which I don't know why they need to be told that, but yeah, they did, I guess. Ellie manages to climb into a car as some of the infected start ripping some of the resistance people apart. And then a giant bloater, a giant bloater, and a couple of clickers climb out of the hole. Perry shoots at the bloater with his automatic rifle, but it absorbs the bullets like a sponge, and it charges at them as he runs out of bullets, and it gets him and rips his head clean off. <laughs> a clicker that got turned when they were still a child finds Ellie in the car and climbs into it with her, 
and Joel can't seem to hit it from the angle that he's at. But Ellie manages to escape the car, trapping it inside because it can't figure out how to get out. And then she sees Sam and Henry under a nearby car about to be grabbed. And she goes towards that car to rescue them. So Joel has to try to shoot the nearby infected to clear her path because they're everywhere and she can't run over there in a straight line without running into them. So Joel keeps shooting them and knocking them down to get them out of her way and to stop other ones from attacking her as she's trying to make this beeline across the street. It's just crazy. Anyway, she makes it over there and she stabs the infected with her knife and then the three of them make a run for it as Joel comes down out of the house. But Kathleen is there and she confronts them. But before she can do anything, the, the little kid clicker that had been locked in the car and who managed to get out apparently jumps on her from a nearby boulder and, and kills her. At that point, even more infected swarm out of the hall. Joel, Ellie, Sam, and Henry make it to an abandoned hotel after they cross the bridge, apparently. And as they talk, we learn that the title of the episode, Endure and Survive, comes from the comic book that Ellie found. Joel invites Henry and Sam to come with him and Ellie to Wyoming, even though previously he had poo-pooed the idea. And it was funny because Ellie said, oh, he says that now, but he'll change his mind. <laughs> Henry tells Sam that he should get some sleep and he leaves Sam and Ellie in a bedroom and they proceed to pretend to go to sleep for a second, but then go back to reading the comic book. Sam uses his little magnetic notepad to ask Ellie if she's scared because he seems to think that she isn't, but she says she's scared all the time. Particularly, she's scared of ending up alone. She then asks him if he's scared, and so he writes her a note on the magnetic pad asking if when someone turns into a monster, is it still them inside? And he shows her that he's been bitten. She then shows him where she was bitten and tells him that her blood is medicine, because she kind of thinks that it is, of course, which we don't really know is true, but she cuts her hand and puts it on his wound to mix some of her blood into it. Sam then asks her to stay awake with him, and she promises that she will, and they hug. In the morning, she wakes up to see Sam sitting on the bed with his back to her. Of course, she goes over to talk to him, and he's already turned. He attacks her, and she runs from the room and into the room where Joel and Henry are. And when Joel goes to help Ellie, Henry grabs his gun and stops him. But he eventually shoots Sam himself, killing him before he can hurt Ellie. Then, of course, freaks out, saying, what did I do? What did I do while holding the gun on Joel? And when Joel tries to get him to give him the gun, he instead turns the gun on himself. Ellie then leaves a note on the fresh graves that Joel has put them in, Henry and Sam, that says, I'm sorry, before walking away in the direction of Wyoming and telling Joel, let's go. At which point he joins her and the episode ends. So this episode was fantastic. Just fantastic. You know, the first game was a long time ago, and I don't remember a lot of it. I remember it more as a feeling than the details. Which is cool while I'm, while I'm watching the show, because it's like, no spoilers. But I kind of remember when they encountered Sam and Henry, but just very, very briefly. I don't remember anything that happened. But what I remember of the game, like I said, is a feeling, an impression of how it was a series of you know, because they're making this journey, Joel and Ellie, and it was a series of them running into other people as well as infected along the way. And those people were either bad guys or good guys. And all of these people in the game that they run into are more than just NPCs. They are well-written characters, well-voiced characters, and they really leave an impression on the player and they really contribute to the story and the feeling of this post-apocalyptic world where everyone is just trying to endure and survive. And the show captures that fantastically. We saw it with Bill and Frank, and now we're seeing it with Henry and Sam and even Kathleen. And it's just amazing. You know, they're, they're essentially little vignettes. They meet these people, they interact with them, and then things happen. And... It's so quick and so brief, you know, in contrast to like The Walking Dead, for example, where from season to season, there would be like new people that the group was interacting with. Those people tended to hang around <laughs> the governor and certainly Negan and, you know, other characters that they encountered over the course of the series. They lingered and their fates 
took a long time to come to fruition, but here it's quick and dirty. And, you know, I think that that is even more impactful than getting to know a character for a long time before they meet their fate. This is like, it, it's just jarring. You know, we get to meet these people and hear a little bit about their story and come to care about them. Again, even Kathleen, you, you, you feel for her, you know, she's not in the resistance because she's evil. She's trying to help people from what she sees as government oppression. And, you know, her brother was killed because some people decided to collaborate with who she sees as the enemy. And even Joel resists working with Henry once he knows that Henry was a collaborator because, of course, he was in a resistance as well. So it, you just, even her, you sort of feel badly for because she's human and she's doing what she's doing because she's in pain. And that's what this show is about. And it's what I've been saying in every review. It's about people. It's about the human condition. It's about what everyone's going through in this ap apocalyptic world. And it's been 20 years. So it's, you know, just very impactful and very moving and, you know, sad, but at the same time, uplifting because Joel and Ellie and other people, you know, are enduring and in the face of it, in spite of it. So it, it's just, it's just a fantastic show. Now I want to talk about the actor who played Sam. He's actually deaf in real life and he communicates with ASL. And we saw in some footage that ran right after the episode that the cast and crew picked up some ASL so they could communicate with him and his liaison or his minder because he's 10, I guess, or whatever, eight. And we also learned that they deliberately chose to make the character deaf so that it would be another like inflection point in the story where he really has to rely on Henry to communicate. I mean, he has his little pad, but like, you know, that's tedious. It's, it's another way in which he's dependent on Henry, just like Ellie is dependent on Joel. And, and we learn in the behind the scenes footage that, and you can see it anyway in the episode, that Sam and Henry are sort of a mirror image of Ellie and Joel in that they're living like the same experience. And um, it's just it's just so well crafted. Just a couple of other things I want to note before I close out my review is that the episode and the whole series really, but the episode in particular, the last two episodes, are about the idea of how far will you go to protect the people that you care about. And it's great because they're showing gradually, as I said, would be the case that, and as it was the case in the game, that Joel comes to care about Ellie over time. He didn't initially care at all about her because he had closed himself off after what happened to his daughter. But in this episode, both times that Ellie was in danger, you could really see that Joel was terrified that something was going to happen to her. He was just beside himself. And, you know, not just concerned because, oh, this girl could be a cure and I've got to get her where she's going. Everybody is depending on me. You know, the future of humanity might be at stake. It wasn't that. It was he didn't want to lose her. And you could see it. And that's, you know, credit to Pedro Pascal, of course, but also the writing. And it's just it's just such a great show. It really is. And I can't wait for next week. I'm a little concerned because there are 10 episodes this season. We have five more. And we know that next week they're going to make it to Wyoming and they're gonna be in you know snowy territory and they run into, I guess, another community of resistors, including Joel's brother. I don't remember Joel's brother from the game at all, <laughs> but nor do I remember them running into this group of survivors. So maybe they didn't in the game. Anyway, I remember where the first game ended, uh, not geographically, but story-wise and feels to me like this part of the game where they get into Wyoming in the snowy area was much further along. So I don't know how that's gonna jibe with the show. And I'm wondering if they're going to get to the end of the first game by the end of the season or not. If season two is going to still be taking place within the narrative of the first game, because there's something very pivotal that happens at the beginning-ish of the second game, and I'm wondering if that's going to happen before the end of season one, 
or not. And I'm kind of hoping it doesn't because it will feel rushed. But anyway, that's really all I have to say. I will be back after the next episode airs to do a review. That's going to be the Sunday after this important sporting thing that's occurring. So a little over a week now. But I'm going to get out of here. Until I return, I wish you peace and long life.